All right. All right. We have to we have a hard stop at five, so how many I could I could do a number of things. How many of you can listen fast? I was doing a teaching and they say, You talk too fast, you need to slow down. I said, I've been talking this fast my whole life. I can't slow down. You need to listen faster. <laughs> I mean, give me a break. I can't help it. Not my fault. Praise God. Go back and listen to the tape. All right. Anybody get a word from Baby Prophet? Not yet? Oh, boy. <laughs> she give me a word one day. Yeah. We have prophecy rooms in um, Awakening House of Prayer, and we raise up people, raise up prophets, and that's one of the first entries that they go. They minister in the... And the prophecy, they don't have to be a prophet to minister in the prophecy rooms. We are a prophetic community. We raise up uh, prophetic people. Um, the same thing we would do in my Ignite Network. We, we, we help people grow in the prophetic, whether they're prophets. You know, even prophets have to grow in the prophetic. Did you know that? And one of the things we need, and what I'm, I'm going to talk to you uh, about now, I'll save the really hard lesson for last. But one of the things we have to get good at in the body of Christ is judging prophecy. And it's like, well, I know a prophetic word, you know, maybe you do, but there's so many people believing so many things that are so wrong. And it's like, you know, there's, there's more than one way to skin a cat and there's more than one way to judge a prophecy. You know, the Bible says in first John four and one, who is texting me during my teaching? I feel re rebuke. Oh, it's my daughter. I can't rebuke her. <laughs> she texted me. Sorry, I actually just read this. It was nice to see you. I missed you. She just visited me. She texted me this screenshot. My mom likes to use the microphone unction rather than typing to text while driving. She's got me pegged. You, how many use your text to... You got to be careful if you're talking to your text because you come sometimes say really bad words. <laughs> like, you better read it before... I mean, it's bad. If you're going to prophesy that thing, you better make double sure. Judging prophetic words. The Bible says in 1 John 4 and 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, or try the spirits, some translations say, to see whether they are from God. And then there's a because. There's a because there. Because is a conjunction. How many of y'all English grammars? It's a conjunction. It connects this to that. My beloved, don't believe every spirit. That means there's a lot of spirits talking, right? Don't believe them all, but test the spirits. Try the spirits. Why? It says because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So if it wasn't for these rubber-lipped false prophets, we could just believe what we heard. But because there are false spirits, because there are false teachers, false apostles, false prophets operating in a false anointing, a false unction, we've got to test and weigh what we hear. I believe down, down under they say you've got to weigh it, weigh it up. And here we say you've got to judge it. Well, just do something with it. Don't, don't believe it just because somebody said it. So we encourage the, uh, pe people to, uh, to, to, to share what they're hearing, but you've got to judge it. Ten, uh, John 10 and 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. But there's also false prophets. Tares are growing up among the wheat. And, and, and Jesus is not going to pull up the tares because he doesn't want to damage the wheat. So that means false prophets are going to be among us, false spirits, false, false pe people with false intentions are going to be uh, with us till Jesus comes back. So we've got to learn how to judge prophecy. There's no reason to be scared of prophecy. Prophets are prophetic people. There is error in some camps of the prophetic ministry. That's why I launched my network. I had a massive encounter with the Lord, and he showed me the, uh, the state of prophetic. This was about a year ago, and he said if something didn't shift, then in the next five years, we were going to see a lot more error. Because believers are not being, most believers, not all, 
many believers, I would say most believers are not being taught how to rightly divide the word of truth. They're not being taught how to judge a prophetic word. They're not being taught how to hear from the Lord for themselves. In Ephesians 4, the Bible says that he, Jesus, when he ascended on high, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry to the edifying of the body of Christ. So the primary function of a New Testament prophet is to equip you, to inspire you to hear from the Lord to equip you how to wage war, to equip you to, 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 to want to pursue, to inspire you to pursue intimacy with God. You know, it's not about, you know, just prophesying, prophesying, prophesying. A prophet's going to prophesy, but a prophet's also going to teach you to prophesy. Well, you can't teach nobody to prophesy. You can teach them to discern the voice of the God, to test the spirits. Here's the ways of God. Here's the will of God. Here's the you, can, you can't teach people to prophesy in the sense of, well, you can't teach people to be a prophet. I understand that. But you can teach them and activate them and, 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 and help them understand this is God. Why? This is not God. Here's where you missed it. This is, this is, this is not the Lord. And you can teach them and train them and help them to, to, to get their ear right. Ultimately, they have to do the work, but you can help them. We all need teachers. So God's thoughts towards you are good thoughts, thoughts of, uh, uh, of, of a hope and a future. And so we should welcome good prof uh, true prophetic words of the Lord, but we have to judge them. We have to judge them. So here's the, here's, here's, I've got a lot of these. I don't know how many of these we'll get through. Um, but we'll do this as, as, as quickly as we can. I might not give uh, full explanations on each one of them if they're rather simple, just so we can get through. So does the prophetic word glorify Jesus? Because John 16, 13 through 15 says, but when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. But he will not speak of his own authority, but he will speak whatever he hears and he will tell you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will receive from me and will declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit is always going to exalt Jesus. Always. The Holy Spirit is not out for his own glory. He's out to exalt Jesus. That's his, one of his functions is to exalt Jesus. He's the one that convicts our hearts and will turn to Jesus. He's the one, you know, he's the one. He glorifies Jesus. So if the prophetic word is glorifying demons, it ain't the Holy Ghost. If the prophetic word is glorifying you, puffing you up, sending you to, that's not the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit will not do that. Number two, is the prophetic word in line with scriptures? This is like foundational. But the problem is many believers don't know the word of God. And so when they hear a prophecy, they can't judge it by Scripture because they don't know the Scripture. So you need to be a student of the Word. Like I said, rightly dividing the Word of truth. If it violates Scripture, it's not the Lord. One of my mentors taught me the Holy Spirit does not speak with a forked tongue. In other words, he does not talk out of both sides of his mouth. So if it's violating scripture now, well, I don't see it in scripture. Well, there's the principles of scripture. There's also the ways of God. We learn about the ways of God by reading the Bible. If it's not, if it's, if something is not according to the way of God, you know, God is a gentleman. He doesn't force himself on you. God is, is forgiving. Who, what was that? Somebody just got a word about something. I can't remember. But if somebody, it, it, let's just say you get a prophetic word. Well, it, that says something like, well, you know, you don't have to forgive that person because they've really hurt you. Well, somebody who's up, who wants to not forgive is going to say that is going to use that word as justification. But there are prophetic people that prophesy stuff like that. The Lord doesn't expect you to forgive. That violates scripture. So, and that's a blatant example, but most of the time it's more subtle. It's more subtle. So if it, so you got to be a student of the word. And if you get a prophetic word and you don't know, then study the scripture on it. Study what the scriptures say about this, that, and the other. You won't always find line on line and precept upon precept. You won't always find chapter and verse. But you'll find the principles of the, of, 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 uh, of the Bible, of scripture in there. Does the word point you toward Jesus? If it doesn't inspire you to follow Jesus, it's not from the Holy Spirit. Revelation 19 and 10. Then he said to me, an angel said to John, write... Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see, see that you do not do that. The angel said to John, I am your fellow servant and of your brothers who hold the testimony of Jesus. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 
A real prophetic word should cause you to chase after Jesus because a, a true prophetic word of promise, you know, it should inspire your heart to get closer to him because he's the one that's going to lead you into the promise. He's the one that gives you the grace to see the promise come to pass. He's the one that's making you the promise. You should want to go closer to him. If it's driving you away from the Lord, if it's causing you to chase idols, it's not God. You get a prophetic word about a house, that could be God, but then you could turn it into an idol. Seek ye first, Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these cars and boats. No. In his righteousness. Number four, does the prophetic word lead you into idolatry? We, we, just, we just talked about that. Matthew 6, 33. Revelation 2 and 20. With idolatry. Jezebel's prophecies will, will many times lead you into idolatry. Revelation 2 and 20, Jesus said to the church at Thyatira, I have these few things against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, to commit adultery and eat things sacrificed to idols. So a Jezebel spirit's prophecies will be seducing. They'll be flattering. They'll be uh, leading you away from God, chasing your own idols. You know, there's a scripture, I believe it's in Ezekiel or it's Jeremiah, and I wish I had written it down, but it speaks about the prophet prophesying to the idolatry in your heart, and the prophet doesn't even know it. So if you're dead set on following an idol, sometimes the Lord will bring someone in your life to prophesy to you that you're going to have that idol and then just let you go ahead and crash and burn until you turn back to him. He does that actually in his mercy. He doesn't do it to be mean. I have offended Annie. She's leaving. Do you have idols? <laughs> no, I'm teasing. She's got to go to practice or work or somewhere. Or for deliverance, I don't know. <laughs> All right. She's awesome. All right. She messed me up, though. Jezebel. No, no, not you. <laughs> I wasn't talking to you. Yeah, Jezebel will lead you into that. Jezebel will lead you into that. Let's see. Um, I've got so many of these, and I, I've got, like, tons of scriptures on each one. My book, 27 Ways to Judge Prophecy, I don't know if there's any of them here, but it goes into great detail in all of this. I don't have time to teach the whole book, but I'm going to give you the, the basic principles. Does the prophecy attempt to establish new doctrine? So this is one way cults are born. Somebody has an experience. They get a prophetic word. They get an angel visit from heaven. There are some religions that were actually, well, Mormonism is one of them. And I think also, which one, is it, which one other is it? It's the uh, Islam with an angel. And there's another one. Not the Nazarenes, but the other one that's kind of like that. I can't remember, but the, no, that's the Mormons. There was one, another one formed by a woman, and she had an angelic visitation, and she ended up hooking up with David Koresh or somebody. Is it Seventh-day Adventist? Well, they, mm. not really. That's like a cult. They have a lot of, they sound like Christians. Um. I might have been the Seventh-day Adventist that had the, was founded by a woman that had an angelic visitation. So you have to be careful with all these angelic visitations giving new doctrine. Like the, the angel Moroni came to Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, and gave him, you know, all these tablets, like, like with Moses. Really, get more, you know, get, at least be original. I mean, <laughs> you know? I mean, the finger of God wrote the tablets that Moses had, but still it was like, Really? So establishing new doctrines, 1 Timothy, Timothy 4, 1 speaks of doctrines of devils. Hebrews 13, 9 speaks of diverse and strange doctrines. Uh, Colossians 2 and 23 speaks of doctrines of men. So there's all this, and we're, we're told to, to, to chase after or to, to, to just lean on sound doctrine. So new doctrines, either, well, there's no more new doctrine. The doctrine's been set by the Bible. People want to twist that and everything, but you know, it wasn't the prophets anyway that established doctrine. It was the apostles in the New Testament that established the doctrine around the New Testament church, not the prophets. Okay, there's fruit. That was, those were the Bible-based tests. Oh, here's one more Bible-based test. Does the prophet acknowledge the lordship of, lordship of Christ and Christ alone? Because there's a lot of New Age prophets, and they're posing as Christians. And some of them are on very popular websites. And they're not confessing the Lord Jesus Christ alone. 
They confess him, but not only him. They're into new age. They're into new age. It happens. And so you got to be very careful just because somebody's, you know, on a certain big giant website. You know, I'm the editor of Charisma, so I'm, I'm, I don't anymore because I'm busy on print. I don't vet every single article that goes on the prophetic stuff, but most of them I still do. We have certain authors I know I can trust. But even with authors you know you can trust, you know, that doesn't mean they can't be off. doesn't mean that they didn't miss it. doesn't mean they're trying to deceive anybody, but anybody can really miss it. They don't have to have an ill intention in their heart. So does the prophet exalt the Lord, exalt the Lordship of Christ in Christ alone? And there's scriptures for all these, but if I gave them to you, we'd be here till 9 o'clock. Uh, the fruit-based based test. The fruit-based test. Do the prophecies come to pass? Now, in Deuteronomy, if the prophecy didn't come to pass, they'd stone you. Thank God that we're in an age of grace. And we don't get stoned if we miss it. However, if you've got a track record, if a prophet has a track record and they always miss it, then you need to stop listening to them. I mean, come on. Just be like the weatherman. If the weatherman in your city was always saying it's going to rain and then it rains on your picnic, you're going to say that weatherman is not accurate. But yet we keep listening to these prophets who have a bad track record. They prophesy, you know, hurricanes. They know hurricanes come. Next time they prophesy uh, rainstorms, then a rainstorm come. Then they prophesy a war in Afghanistan. And the next time they ain't no war in Afghanistan. And they miss it over and over and over and over. Timed, dated prophecies. They missed it, missed it, missed it, missed it. And we still keep listening to them and sending them money. Uh-oh. Tarabash de kete. We still keep sending them money. Why? Maybe we maybe they need to go back to I don't know. I'm gonna be stopped now. <laughs> and that whole thing about touch my not my no I didn't do my prophecy no harm. That's true, but that is so twisted. Oh, you better not say nothing about the man of God. Well, I ain't saying nothing about him. I'm saying something about the own words that didn't come to pass. You know, he's awesome, love him, love her, whoever it is. I ain't talking about anybody. I'm talking about the prototype one that does. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them on the Internet. The Internet prophets. There should be an Internet prophet society. <laughs> and they could all join, and then we would just all know they're all false. <laughs> we should do that. And then they could charge like $1,000 to join. They could make their money from each other. Instead of out of my pocket. I ain't getting it out of my pocket. Oh, don't get me started. Do the prophecies produce liberty? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians 3 and 17. Romans 8 and 15. For you have not received the spirit of slavery again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. If the, spirit, if, if the prophecy makes you feel oppressed... That's not the Lord. He came to set the captives free. He didn't come to oppress you. It should liberate you. Number, number three on the spirit-based test is a prophecy seek to control. There's controlling prophecies. I had a girl tell me she joined my network, and then the next day she says, well, I told my pastor, I, I told my prophet, who's her pastor, that I, I, I was in your network, and he prophesied over me, and he said that the Lord would say to me that I would never be in anybody's church or network, but I would always be under. That, not, come on. And she believed it. And I didn't want to tell her that's wrong because I'm not going to come against her. I, it's not my pa place to come against her pastor. What's it going to do? It's not going to do me any good to do that. I prayed, but I'm not going to. It's not my place. I don't have that relationship with her. And maybe she was exaggerating. I guess one side of the story. Maybe her husband told her to get out. She made up a story about her. I don't know, but I don't get involved in that stuff. It's not wisdom. God, does, he gave us a free will. He doesn't try to control us. So if the God doesn't try to control us, then any prophecy that would seek to control can't possibly be from God. So that's where it's helping to understand the ways of God. And we say amen, and we say amen, and we believe that, but then you get under some trial, and some prophet comes through and says something, or you get lost, you don't know what to do, and all of a sudden you're believing something because you want to believe something so badly, and that's where we get where we can really miss it. You know, when we're on the mountaintop, it's, it's easy to judge these things. When we're going desperate to hear from God and we can't hear from him, that's when we're more likely to be deceived by prophetic voices that aren't of God. Or, does the prophecy breed fear? If it does, it's not of God. Second Timothy 1 and 7. God does not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. Now, the prophecy may bring the fear of the Lord. If I get, uh, yeah, I've gotten words about different things the Lord's going to have me do. 
and I get to fear the Lord over it, like, you know, like, oh my goodness, I better walk a you know, narrow path. I better spend more time in prayer. I better, you know, spend more time in the word. Like I have a fear of the Lord. Like I don't want to miss this opportunity. Like I need to press in harder. That's the fear of the Lord. That's okay. That's different. So re- respect of the Lord. Number five, does the prophetic word produce stability or instability? Here's the thing. I'm seeing far too much instabi- instability in the prophetic. Far too much instability. Prophets are, are statesmen. I ain't looking at you for no reason. I just noticing you're here, waiting for you to smile at me. Prophets are statesmen. It, prophets are ambassadors. Actually, the Bible says that we are ambassadors of, of Christ. So if, if think about just from a natural perspective of an ambassador from the United States that's sent over to, I don't know, Turkey or England or, or wherever. Now, that ambassador, would, would you, you're representing your nation. You're representing, uh, you know, well, your nation. As ambassadors of Christ, we're representing Christ. As prophets, you're an oracle of God. You're a spokesperson for God. Would it make any sense to go over there and, and, and act in an unbecoming way, to act a, a weird and goofy, to act, ooh, and all this kind of crazy stuff we see going on? Does, is that, it's not, because repre- I never see Jesus acting like that. Jesus is the prototype prophet. So, you know, if, if, if there's all this goofy stuff where it's like people want to say, what's well, the Holy Ghost? Ah, I'm not so sure that's always the Holy Ghost. And I'm not against, you know, a little shaking or a little juking, but there's some people that just, you know, it's the Lord. It's the flesh. It's the flesh. So you got to, what is that? Is that confirmation or is that the devil? You heard that? Isaiah 35, 3 and 4 declares, Strengthen the weak hands and support the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful of heart, Be strong, fear not. Your God will come with vengeance, even with a recompense, and he will come and save you. So the prophetic word should bring stability in your life, not an instability. It shouldn't make you wonder what's going to happen. It shouldn't be, oh no, you know, it should should strengthen you, not not make you weaker. I had a, a prophet one time come through our church, you know, when I was in this one apostolic church, and the guy prophesied, you know, you're about to go through one of the most hor- horrific trials of your life. Oh, praise God. Thank you. You're about to go through one of the most horrible trials of your life, and, and you're just, you know, it's going to be really hard, and you're going to wonder if you've done something wrong. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. This is terrible. And so, I mean, it, like, it, it scared me. It made me feel weak and, and incapable of standing against whatever was coming. So I went to my apostle and I asked him at the time, I said, this is this and this. And I knew this prophet was the real deal, man. He's a good guy. And I said, and he says, that was a good word, but he did not give you the other side. And I'm getting ahead of myself. And this is in my next teaching. He didn't give you the other side. See, you don't want to prophesy somebody is going to go through a trial without prophesying the other side. And when you come out, you're going to be stronger and you're going to be more prosperous and the Lord's going to put an anointing on. You're going to have wisdom and there's going to be a double blessing. I mean, there's got to be another side because otherwise you're just scaring people and making them feel weak and dreadful. I mean, I was looking around, waiting where the devil was going to hit me. I didn't know what was about to happen to me. It was bad. It brought bred fear. It brought bred instability. That was horrible until I went finally and asked for some help. Sometimes you get a prophetic word and you can't make sense of it or you get a bad feeling. Go ask somebody. Get some help, get some counsel from somebody, but not from somebody that doesn't believe in prophecy because that's just like beating your head against the wall. Somebody, I was on Dr. Michael Brown's radio show the other day and somebody accused me of being a false prophet. And, and I'm like, uh, and so Dr. Michael Brown had me back on the show. Uh, I listened to the tape and he had me back on the show and he said, well, what would you say to that? And I said, well, based on your conversation, let me make sure I understand this gentleman that you had on your show who was accusing me of such a thing. I said, apparently he did not believe that there's prophets today, right? He, that's right. He's, he's from a denomination that doesn't believe there's prophets. I said, so, so by virtue of this belief, this deception of his, that there are no false prophets, there are no prophets today, anybody that would claim to prophesy would automatically be a false prophet. Yes, that's right. I said, well, there you go. And there are those who, who uh, people have made T-shirts about words I've given, like the pirate Christian, you know. Have you, have you seen the squid T-shirt? No? You heard the teaching? Some... Somebody made a T-shirt that says, no squid formed against me shall prosper. And it's got a big squid on it because I was teaching about the squid spirit. And I wanted to order five of them and, like, resell them. 
just give them away or something. I mean, because, yes, no squid formed against me. Then they made the squid put my face in the middle, and I'm like floating in the squid. <laughs> yeah, if you type in my name in squid spirit, I have been. And then they, somebody else wrote an article, 12 ways to discern if you're under attack by the squid spirit. And it was like all this bogus stuff, like you have 10 toes. And it's like it was, you know, like a, I got so attacked by that. I said, boy, that squid spirit got exposed. Don't like it. What is that? It's a mind-binding spirit. It's a spirit of mind control. But, you know, sometimes spirits look like things. You know, the best way, you know, in the Bible, you had the, you know, how all kind of weird creatures in the Bible. All kinds of weird creatures. Like, I wouldn't even know what you'd call them. We can only describe what they look like. You know, Ezekiel saw stuff and Zechariah. They all saw this, all these weird things. They described it. They know what it looked like. Even in the book of Revelation, John described these these creatures, these things, these scenes. And he didn't know how to, he had a, had a, he just used his terms. That's, that's, it, the squid spirit looks like a squid. Maybe that's not what it's called, but that's what it looks like. So we use a vernacular so that we know what we're talking about. And I know when I said I bind you squid spirit, it stopped manifesting. So, hey, any of y'all got a squid spirit? And somebody visited the Awakening House of Prayer, and I told that story. And they went on there, and they gave us one star. They said, this woman believes in squid spirits. You reported her. You rebuked her and cast the squid spirit. I said, wait till she gets a squid spirit. <laughs> and she'd be right back up here. Mm hmm Wait till you get one, woman. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I said, well, but praise Jesus. It's real. So now, the clarity-based test, is the prophetic word ambiguous? Ambiguous means capable of being understood in two or more possible senses or ways. In other words, there's a lot of gray area. A lot of gray area. The first, first Timothy 4 and 1, the Bible says the Holy Spirit speaks. Now, sometimes the Holy Spirit does speak in parables. It does speak in symbols. But, you know, if the Holy Spirit really wants to, really needs you to understand something right now, you're going through a trial, and, you know, and it's like you've got to make a big decision tomorrow, and a prophet comes, he's not going to have that prophet prophesy something that even if you stayed up all night and prayed, you still wouldn't know what it meant because it could mean 12 or 15 different things. There's people that are prophesying stuff, and it means it, 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 there's no way to prove if they're right or wrong because you, there's no sense in telling what it means. Like, how do you really know? What, the, what are they even saying? The water's wet, Yes. It's out there. One seeth it. I seeth it all the time. When Isaiah prophesied to Hezekiah he would live seven more years, it was clear. He didn't have to wonder how long he was going to live. You know, when Elijah prophesied it would not rain, but according to his word, it was clear. No one had to wonder what he meant. It didn't rain until he said it was going to rain. Uh, when Elijah prophesied to the woman that her meal and oil would not run out until the Lord sent rain on the earth, she didn't have to wonder what it meant, if it was her spiritual oil, if it was her natural oil, because many times prophets, what they'll do is they'll say, no, 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 I meant it was a spiritual thing, see. But you said I was going to have a baby. It was a spiritual baby. You know, and everything, it, it becomes, it was, a, it, was a, it was a spiritual thing. So you, you can't prove them wrong necessarily. It's just bad. Does the prophetic word bring confusion? 1 Corinthians 14, 32 and 33. The spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Number three on the clarity-based test, does the prophecy bring confirmation? A lot of personal prophecy is confirmation. But I'm not of the school that believes 100% of personal prophecy all the time, forever, is always confirmation. I believe, you know, because I see in the Bible prophetic announcements. When the, when the angel prophesied to Mary, you're going to be with child, or prophesied to Elizabeth, you're going to be with child, they weren't like, I knew it. The Lord already told me that. No, they were like, wait, what? I'm what? Like, they didn't believe it. When the angel came and said to Abraham and Sarah, you're going to have a child, they're like, I'm barren. I, I ain't got no more eggs, and he's got no more. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't not a confirmation. So don't believe it's always, I believe most of the time it is. Like, you have a, you kind of knew that, or you sensed that. Maybe you couldn't articulate it, but it's like, okay, that's confirmation. But not always. I don't believe it's always. 2 Corinthians 13 and 1, this is the, Paul said, this is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So confirmation is evidence. Who bears witness? Uh, an evidence is one who bears witness, and who bears witness? The Holy Spirit. So I could go on and on about that. I got a big section there, but let me move on. The spirit-based test. Does your spirit bear witness to the word? 
Does your spirit bear witness to the word? 1 John 2 and 20, but you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. I've got a lot more scriptures there too. But you know, you'll, you'll sort of bear, when you ever get a prophetic word and you just feel icky, you're like, eh. And you can't really prove it, but you just kind of know that doesn't bear witness. Like, uh, go with that check. Go with that check. Because, you know, even if you're wrong and it was a good word, you know, it's not like God's, he's going to find another way to get it to you. He's going to make it clear. He's going to, but I'd rather reject a true word than accept a false one. Because the false word that you prophet, that you re-prophesy over your life, the false word that you contend with and war with and put your faith on is the false word that's going to bring the enemy's plan into your life because you're agreeing with something false and you will get that false thing. Does that make sense? Do other mature Christians bear witness to the word? You know, I mean, sometimes your pastor or your friends, I might be controlling, they might not want to see you succeed, they might be jealous. But the bottom line is, you know, if you're making a big life decision, you know, about moving across the country, you want to get other people to weigh in. You want to get other counsel. There's wisdom in the counsel of many, according to the, Psalm, to the Proverbs. Uh, does the prophecy stir our spirits to pray and seek the Lord more for insight? Prophecy should stir us up to, to find out the fullness of what God is saying. Light a fire and just to take action. Faith without works is dead. So if you really believe in the prophecy, you're going to act on it. And it should stir. I believe that true prophetic words, I believe that true prophetic words are wrapped in the faith required to believe them. In other words, the Bible says that faith comes by hearing the word of God. I believe it's the true prophetic word. It's carrying the faith with it to bring itself to pass if you'll receive it and believe with it also. Does that make sense? Uh, number four is the prophetic word loving. Now, that doesn't mean uh, that, uh, you know, you might, some prophetic words can be a, a correction or, or a rebuke from a prophet. It really can be. Most, that's not really going to be in public. Don't look at me that way, Pastor Sierra. I ain't re fixing to rebuke you. She looked at me like, no, what did I do? Matthew 24, 11 and 12 says, and many false prophets will rise and will deceive many because iniquity will abound and the love of many will grow cold. Here's the thing. God is love. So prophecy must come from God, if it's true, then that prophecy will be rooted in love. You might not feel like it's love, it might be discipline, but it's going to be rooted in love. And a, a prophet will deliver it, even if it's a correction, a prophet will deliver it. Right, we'll talk more about that later. Does the prophecy ed edify, comfort, and exhort? Now, if it's a simple gift of prophecy, it will abide by 1 Corinthians 14, 13. He who prophesies speaks to men for their edification, exhortation, and comfort. And then the character-based tests, there's a few of these. Does the prophecy exalt the prophet? I've seen too many prophets or prophetic people prophesy stuff that really exalts them and their ministry instead of Jesus. You know, I had this one uh, guy... And um, I might have told you the story. I don't know. But Moses was very meek, gentle, kind, and humble. He was more meek than any man on the earth. He was not exalting himself with his prophetic ministry. There was a prophet that out there. He, he said he predicted the Houston flooding. I guess it was a year or two ago. And he predicted this. He was like, oh, I was in Houston. Lord, show me this place was going to flood. And then it flooded. It's like, okay, how does that exalt Jesus? you just puffing yourself up. You're just trying to show us that you got it right. But now how do I even know that you really prophesied that because you didn't say nothing about it until after it happened? Oh, Lord told me. Well, it's easy to say that after it happened. So you just use it as, as, a, as, a, as an opportunity to exalt yourself and how accurate you are. Anybody that wants to talk all the time about how accurate they are, and it, it, that's just poor character. The Bible says, let another man praise you, not your own mouth. So it's, it's okay in the context of teaching if you can say, here's, here's how I avoid missing it, you know, here's how I've developed a strong track record. But to, to, to say, I'm, you know, I had this one uh, apostle that I know, he would say, I never miss it. Well, you just did, buddy. Because there's no perfect one other than Jesus. And to, to, to be under the impression or the, you know, the, that you can't miss it or that you never miss it, you're already, give me a break. Haughty. Number two, does the prophetic word offer fi a financial directive that benefits the prophet or otherwise pressures you to give? 
Now, some people will feel pressured to give just because you take up a simple offering. You ain't trying to get that money out of my... No, you know, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the ones I was in. I think I was in Houston and uh, a lot of false prophets in Houston, I guess. I guess I, I, was, in, I was in Houston and this uh, prophet was prophesying, you got to come put this money in my hand. And when you do, you're going to have a money miracle, but it's got to be at least $200. And you got to hurry, 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 hurry. Come, 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 quick, quick, quick. Hurry, 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 like the anointing's going to expire. And you're going to get a money miracle. And you're going to see when you get back to your chair, open your wallet, open your purse, open your purse, open your purse, open your purse. And, the, and, and like everybody's rushing to put this money in this guy's hand. And then they go and look at their wallet and they're like, oh. And then finally, you know, oh, check a bank account, check a bank account, check a bank account. Go online, check a bank account. And, everybody, and, and, and everybody's in a frenzy. And then finally, you hear this lady going, ah! And I'm like, she realized she got ripped off. <laughs> but that wasn't what it was. She said, I found this, I found this, I'm going to testify, I'm going to testify. She comes up with this crinkly, wrinkled up dollar with Cheeto grease on it. She said, I didn't have this before, but I gave my $200, and now I have gotten this dollar from the Lord. And I'm thinking to myself, are you, like, what kind of dumb are you? I'm sorry, but, like, what brand of stupid is that? You gave 200 and you got a dollar back. Now, I'm not good at math, but I don't think that adds up. And not only that, but if the Lord was going to bless you, dear God, he wanted, was he, you know, Holy Ghost likes Cheetos? I mean, I don't know. Was that an angel, you know, getting some cheese puffs? I don't get it. I mean, really? I mean, but this stuff is really going on. And so I left. I left. Yeah, that too. There, there's different. In, down in uh, Central America, it's really bad too. Uh, number three, what is the consistent character of the vessel through which the prophet came? There's, a, there's the 10 M's of Bill Hammond. I don't have time to go through those. We're gonna, getting close for time. Does the prophecy publicly rebuke, correct, or reveal negative personal information? I just find it. Somebody sent me an email the other day, and they said, this prophet called me out at my church, and they accused me of all this sin, and I said it wasn't, I didn't do that, and they shamed me publicly until I admitted that I had done it, and I don't know what to do because I didn't do it, but I was under so much pressure, and he would not stop prophesying it, so I finally just agreed to it. And I'm like, my gosh, this stuff happens. She's like, what do I do? I'm like, write curses. Is the prophet submitted to a local church? Now, there are times where you can't, you can't find a church to go to. But if, if you have zero accountability in your life, like forever, like who's your spiritual father? This one guy wanted to be in Charisma Magazine so bad. And then one of the other editors wanted to put him. I said, I said well, who is it? He claims to do miracles. I said, well, who is he? Well, I don't know. Well, what church does he go to? He doesn't go to a church. I said, well, who's the spiritual father? Well, he says he doesn't have one. Well, I'm sorry, but like, and you could be legit. It could be that you have not met your spiritual father, your spiritual mother. Your pa it could be. But, you know, we have to be so careful in these days. And he, but here was the sign. He got massively offended that we asked. Massively offended. Well, I mean, you know, if you weren't, I mean, you wouldn't, I wouldn't, it wouldn't offend me. Even if I didn't have one, I would just say I, I was in this controlling church and I came out of it and I haven't found a place yet, but here's you know, three people that know me well. I mean, it, you know, you, somebody's got to know you well. Even if they're not an authority over your life, you should be able to say, hey, these are the people I run with, do life with. Number six, is the prophecy delivered in anger or judgment? Love suffers long and is kind. Some people are, are happy. They're, you ever seen an angry prophet? They're just happy to deliver judgment words. They're happy. All these doom and gloomers are on the internet. They're happy. They, they want to see our nation curse. They want to see hurricanes come. They want to see these things. It's a wrong spirit. Jeremiah was a weeping prophet. He prophesied judgment, 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 judgment. He did it through tears. Not false ones either, real ones. Does the prophet try to get you alone on the word... In, alone to deliver the word of the Lord, the parking lot prophets. They don't want to hear nobody. We had a woman in our ministry at one point. She would always, I'd be like, I prophesy over everybody. It was, service is over. She's got them over there in the corner prophesying. I'm like, what, what more does the Lord have to say? And why do you have to do it over in the corner after service is over and there's three people left in the church? It's like, that's like, there's something wrong with that. Call them parking lot prophets because they wait until you're outside getting in your car and they chase you down with a word. Are you dealing with a false prophet? I've got a whole teaching on that that we're not going to get into. But the Bible says in Matthew 7 
that there are many false prophets and false Christs that shall rise and show signs and wonders to, to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. And I don't believe false prophets start off as false prophets. I believe that there's a, a road to deception. There's a compromise somewhere. Praise God. We've got 45 minutes till we have to end, so if anybody needs to go to the bathroom, anything you can go. Otherwise, I'm just going to teach on. If we take a break, we won't get anywhere on this next lesson. So if anybody needs to stretch or get up or walk or go to the bathroom, just go ahead. But I'm going to move on to the next lesson. The next lesson is about prophetic protocols. And this is stuff that doesn't get taught a whole lot. And I think this is part of the reason why we see so much goofy in the prophetic. Because it's not taught. Why? Well, people would much rather hear how to prophesy than they would like to hear the guidelines for it. But to equip people how to prophesy without giving them some boundaries, without giving them some banks on the river, you know, you're just asking for all kinds of goofy. You're just asking for all kinds of mess. And so I think that's part of the reason that we're just people are not teaching this. I, I, I don't even know how I learned it, honestly, because I guess just through studying Scripture because nobody taught me. This is going to be in my prophetic manual, which will be out in like a month or two. So I'm going to have to shortcut this one too, and I do want to take some questions. Um, but I want to give you, because I've got so many. Number one, does it abide by 1 Corinthians 4, 3, to edify, comfort, and exhort? We're talking about the simple gift. I'm not going to spend much time on that. But edification, exhortation, and comfort is your guideline. That's your boundary. If you're a prophet, a five-fold prophet, you can go beyond that. But if you're not, and even if you are, your personal prophecy usually falls within that realm. Number two, use wisdom in releasing prophetic words. Use wisdom. Just because someone, just because the Lord told you something, doesn't mean you need to open your mouth and share it. You might just need to pray about it. Might need to share it in two months, two weeks, a year, or never. Many times the Lord shows you stuff, not so you can share it, but so you can pray over it. And if we would get that, we'd stop hurting so many people. It's just not necessary. Why do people want to do that? Because they want everyone to know they heard from the Lord. Well, how do I know if I'm supposed to release it? Well, the same Holy Ghost that gave you the word will tell you if to release it or not. But many times we don't wait. We just rush ahead of him. I heard the word, blah, 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 like right smack, smack more out of your mouth. Um, number three, don't prophesy to people you don't know alone without a strong unction from the Lord. This is for your protection. If you prophesy to people you don't know very well and you're alone and it's not recorded, they can say that you said this and you said that. In our prophecy rooms, we record all the prophecies because we don't want people, because they're all coming from various churches, and we don't want them going to their pastor and saying, oh, you know, they prophesied this over me. And that's not what we said. Here, pastor, here's what we said. Here's the recording. Because people hear sometimes what they want to hear. So it's for your protection that you don't do that without recording it. Don't showboat or get goofy. You don't want to draw, number four, you don't want to draw attention to yourself. You're trying to exalt Jesus. You don't want to draw attention to yourself. Not on purpose. I mean, you might... The Lord might have you do something very dramatic in delivering a word. And it might draw attention to you. But that's not your goal, is to be seen. Number five, in a prophetic team ministry setting, be aware of your facial expressions and gestures. We don't need to go too deep into that. But if you're on a team and, and one person's prophesying and you're going, <laughs> that's not helpful. So just watch your facial expressions if you're on a team. I'm going through these so, so quickly. I want to focus more on some others than, than others, so I'll stop and go slower on some that, that are really vital. Number six, don't compare your prophetic flow with anyone else's. This is how you get in trouble. 2 Corinthians 10 and 2 says, We dare not count or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. It's not wise. So you can get in prophetic error trying to be like somebody else. And there's nothing wrong with admiring someone's style, and you do pick up stuff from people. You know, Pastor Sierra says stuff that sounds like me now because she's been sitting under me for six or seven months, so she's already starting to pick up certain mannerisms or little things I say. 
but that's normal for a spiritual parent that you'll pick some. But that she's not trying to prophesy. She's not prophesy like I do. It's different. Number seven, in case of a strongly bad reaction from someone to whom you're prophesying, remain calm and peaceable. You don't want to argue. You prophesy over somebody and they say, that ain't the Lord. What are you talking about? You don't want to argue back. You just say, well, you know, if, if, if I've missed it, I'm sorry. I believe that was the Lord. I'll be praying. And certainly you, you, you hear from God and you can judge us for self. You just be very humble. You, too many prophets out there, prophetic people, they're just defending themselves and they're arguing. I know that was from the Lord. Well, you just got it's bad character, really bad character. Number, I've never had that happen, but, I've, but it can happen. I've heard it happening. Number eight, don't avoid in- accountability. Stay humble and teachable. You, many times you learn more from your mistakes than you do from your successes. I didn't, you know, you, you can learn to prophesy by getting it right, but you can also learn great lessons if you miss it. So stay humble. Here's one I'll spend a little more time on. Number nine, how you n- deliver prophetic words with diplomacy. How you deliver the word matters. It's not just what you say, but how you say it. It's the same thing in that normal conversation. If I came to you, brother, and I said, and I said, good morning. You'd be like, well, she's in a bad move. I said, good morning. You'd be like, well, she's happy to see me. It's the same message. But it's delivered in a different way. The spirit behind it. In the, the diplomacy in the prophetic. How you deliver a prophetic word can make the difference in whether somebody receives it or not. If you deliver a corrective word, it should be done after much prayer, even grieving and weeping. Your tone should reflect the heart of God, which is love. Delivering words of warning must also be done with diplomacy to avoid perceptions of judgment on a person as if they're in some way to blame. See, most people have, they feel like they're doing something wrong anyway. You know, they feel like there's something wrong with them anyway. They don't need you to deliver a word in a way that confirms their worst fears about themselves. I was in a major ministry one time visiting and I discerned a Jezebel spirit that was operating there and I was freaked out by it I'm like I cannot believe a Jezebel spirit has infiltrated this massively huge ministry and I talked with one of the generals in the prophetic about it I said we were talking about something else and I said you know I was such and such and I saw this and I'm like I'm not going to say anything but dear God like what do you do with that other than pray and she says you know she goes if you chose to say something to the leader, because I knew the leader, it's a very, very large ministry. If I called the name, you'd know it, but I'm not going to. She said, you could just go to this leader and say, instead of saying, instead of saying, there's a Jezebel spirit that is all in your ministry. It's really destructive. You could just say, you know, the Lord has shown me that there's an assignment of Jezebel and that your intercessors really need to be praying strong to root out any influence of that you know, and you pose it in a way that doesn't make it sound like an accusation. You pose it in a way that doesn't make it sound like an attack on them. Like they've, you pose it in a way, you know, that, that just, it's like a warning without laying blame. Because if I went and said, man, there's, how, how, there's a Jezebel spirit in your ministry. I was shocked by that. Lord showed me so clearly how Jezebel is there, here and there. And, and this one has a Jezebel. I mean, the leader is Im- immediately going to get defensive and feel attacked. Feel like they've, li- they've done something wrong. So you don't do that. They won't receive the word. They'll, they'll push back. Number 10, commit yourself to prophetic accuracy. Plum, pl- plumb line what you receive against the word, like we talked about earlier. Test the spirits. You know, I was in, uh, I think I was in Clewiston, a little small city in Florida. I was passing through there on my way to somewhere else to minister. And the Lord began to speak to me about uh, a trauma or a devastation of the land like in the 19, I think it was the 1920s. And I was like, and he wanted me to say that the God was going to heal the land. And I'm like, I want to look this up. I'm going to Google this real quick and see if there was something that happened before I get up there. Like, I'm going to test this. If you can test it, if the Lord gives you a piece of history or a date and you can check it out before you review it, check on that pressure, then that's where you start to miss it. The same thing like this thing, if you're in school and you're taking a test, you know, and they give you five minutes, all of a sudden you're, you've got pressure to finish this thing. You're more likely, even if you know the answer, to fill in the wrong bubble because you're, you're, you're feeling all this pressure. 
So you've got to be very careful. Don't put that pressure on people. I have different churches. Well, we're really expecting you to have a word for all our leaders and all our people and all our church and all our... I'm like, dear God, like, put more pressure on me. Why don't you? Like, you know, I mean, it's one thing to say we're really praying and we believe God's given you a message for us. But what we're just, we, all of our leaders, they need a personal prophecy. We're really expecting you to come through. It's like you're putting pressure on me. You don't mean to. You're probably just desperate for God. But the better thing to do as a leader of a church would be just, just to pray, Lord, put a word in the prophet's mouth. We really need some direction. We're, we've pressed into you. We're not hearing you. Would you help us? Would you please send this one messenger with a word? Rather than putting all that pressure on me that I got to now go pray for 12 hours hope and I get something. Because if the Lord doesn't give me something, I ain't got nothing. And how much pressure you want to put on me does not help. It makes it worse. Number 12, don't overthink it. You can talk yourself right out of giving a good prophetic word. So you want to judge it, but you don't want to overthink it. And there's times where you're just at an altar or something, and you don't have time to judge nothing. Like, you should have a filter in your spirit. You should know, you know, your mind should be renewed enough to know that it's not God. If it's not God, if it's your thought, if it's not your thought. But you can talk yourself right out of it. Judge by your spirit, not by your soul. We talked about this already, number 13. Remember the spirit of prophecy can speak through impressions, through inner witness, through a burden. There's many, 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 many different ways the Lord speaks. So sometimes you'll go through a season as a prophetic person where he'll stop speaking to you so much in the way you're familiar with and start speaking to you in other ways. And if you're not sensitive and open to the spirit, you will miss it because you're listening for him this way and he's talking to you in this way. He wants you to be fluent in the spirit, and that means learning the whole language of God and the many different ways he speaks. He'll speak to you predominantly in one or two or three ways most of the time. But, you know, there'll be a season sometimes where he's just trying to teach you, grow you, and, and, and stretch you. Lord's, you know, really started giving me a lot of dreams, I guess, in the past year or so. A lot, a lot of dreams. Number 16, don't force someone to agree with your prophetic word. If they don't bear witness to it, just ask them to pray about it. The Holy Spirit is the convincer, not you. Don't force them to agree. Don't argue with them. This one lady in our ministry, she's no longer in our ministry, thank God, because she was tearing the church down. But she used to get these words of knowledge, and she would say them over people. And it wasn't that they weren't necessarily accurate. It's that they were mistimed, and they were inappropriate for that setting. And she'd say, well, the Lord showed me that when you were two, this and this happened to you. And the person would be like, no, no, it didn't. Well, maybe it did, but, like, they didn't want the other five people standing there to know it. And so they rejected it. Or it could be that it was blocked in their subconscious, in their memory, and it hadn't surfaced yet. And there's a time when the Holy Spirit wants to deal with it. But just because you see something on somebody doesn't mean that the Lord's wanting to deal with that thing right now. Again, you, gotta, you don't just need to, you know, have prophetic. I'm not going to use that word. Prophetic diarrhea of the mouth, where it's just like, <laughs> chew on it a while. And she would always say, but God said. And they'd be like, no, 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 but God said. She'd argue. It's bad. If you're on a prophetic ministry team, please do not prophesy the exact opposite of what someone else on the pro team just prophesied. The Lord's going to send you to Chicago. The Lord's going to send you to New York. You're just bringing confusion. That's why it's better, I mean, in a public setting, it's just better most of the time not to, if you're not a five-fold prophet, it's best not to prophesy directional words because you're supposed to be edifying exhortation and comfort. I'm not saying you can't or you could never. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you have to really be mature in that simple gift of prophecy to go there. It's usually not wisdom. If you're just starting out, you know, don't start telling people who they should marry. We call it mates, dates, and babies. Who you, should, who you should marry, who you should date, how many babies you should have, when you should, when you should have them. I mean, that gets like it's really in someone's life. And it's, it's, I don't know, you can be almost like playing God, playing Holy Ghost. Number 18, if a younger, I'm going to skip this because it's more of about, about a group. Number, number 19, uh, 17 was don't prophesy the exact opposite. 18 is, there's just too many of these for me to get through, so I'm going to skip ahead to some of the ones that are the most relevant. Uh, these will all be in my prophetic training manual. Um, never release a prophetic word that's going to embarrass someone publicly. You don't want to do that. We talked about directional words. Don't give someone a highly directional word in a personal prophecy setting. 
don't correct or publicly rebuke them. We, we talked about all that, dates, mates, babies, and offices. The offices thing, people come through, prophets come through, and they prophesied this one guy was a prophet. Well, he wasn't a prophet, but the apostle of our church, because this famous prophet said that this other guy was a prophet, we let him on the prophetic team, and you know we were doing our little meetings with him afterwards, and within about three months, he was gone. He had so much warfare against his life that he was taken right out of the church. See, if you're not a prophet, you can't handle the warfare that a prophetic mantle brings. So, you know, you, 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 I don't like doing those. I don't go places and call people out. Of their pro- I might say you have a prophetic call in your life, but I don't do that because it can, you know, maybe the, maybe the pastor, maybe whatever church I'm in, maybe the pastor knows you're a Jezebel and, you know, you, you got a false prophetic spirit on you and I'm just prophesied that you're the prophet of the house. And so I'm going against the government of the house and contradicting the pastor. And so you don't want to, you don't want to do that. You, if you feel like someone is a prophet you, and you're in, preaching in somebody's church or something, or you're ministering, or even in your own church, you feel like so-and-so, go to the pastor and talk to the pastor. It's the order. God is a God of order. You don't want to do that. Don't deliver, uh, number 23, don't deliver, we're probably out of order now, but that's all right. You get the manual and you can learn. You can also take my prof- all my prophetic training at nextlevelprophetic.com. So 18 lessons. 18, how much is it? It's Pastor Sierra, how much is it for the whole prophetic course? Five thousand dollars? No. <laughs> three ninety-seven. I think it's three ninety-seven, and they're putting in a payment plan because they're re redo retooling it. So I think it's three ninety-seven, or it's yeah, it's like four hundred. But the payment plan, I think it's more than that because there's the gateway provider charges us for each payment or something. But the whole thing is three three nine. I believe it's three ninety seven. We just changed it. Nextlevelprophetic.com. You're welcome. All right. Here's one that just drives me nuts. Don't deliver a prophetic word in a wishy washy tone as if you're not sure you believe it. There's one young lady that I know, and she's she's gifted, but she'll say, "Well, you know, I I think I heard the Lord say, I mean, you know, maybe I I'm I'm pretty sure I I I I." I I, 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 you know, I, I, and it's like, just, you know, if you're not confident, why should I be? Now, I understand people are learning and there's a time for that. But, you know, after you've been trained and equipped, you've been through my school and you're still like wishy-washy, what could be, yes, I'm a, it's like, you know, go back and pray. When you get confident about it, you come back and tell me. Or, you know, if you're not confident and you're scared, I, I get it. Write it down and just give the person the piece of paper. Just write it down. It's all good. Just get the word out. But if you if you if you come across like like that, no one's gonna believe you. Don't point people to angels. Point people to God. The Lord may prophesy about angels, but we want to be sure they know the Lord is in command is in command of the angels. There's all this uh, thing about commanding angels. We don't command angels. We declare the word, and the angels hearken to the voice of His word. Psalm 103:20. But we don't command angels. I've got a new book. It's I was on Jim. I'm gonna be on Jim Baker's show twice more for the same book three times in a row, flying up there three separate trips. But it's called Angels on Assignment Again. And it has, you know, all kinds of study on angels, but then also uh, angel activations. And I just also did a CD that went to the printer today called Prayers That Activate Angels. It's not out yet, but it'll be out soon. If you want to read about that or learn about that, it's at angelsprophecy.com. So don't point people to angels, point people to God. We don't worship angels, but we'd be foolish to ignore them. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead. Um, don't touch the person you're prophesying over without asking permission. You know, you, you, head and shoulders, you know, you don't put your man, hand on a man's belly if you're a woman. You don't put your, your hand on a, you don't, you don't do this to a woman if you're a man. You don't touch them right here. I see a lot of that going on. Sometimes, you know, people forget because they just start going down the line. They just, they forget. But I've seen people just like, it's just you don't do that. So don't do that. It can really offend a lot of people. It's just not really appropriate. You might not mean anything by it. You might forget sometimes. But anyway, th- that's a big thing. Head, neck, or shoulders only. Uh, number 26, don't try to interpret what a prophecy or vision may mean when you deliver it unless you have a clear interpretation from the Lord. If you aren't rock solid on what it means, leave it to the person to pray through. Here's the thing. You could be right spot on with what you see or what you hear, but you try to start explaining what you see 
and what you heard and what it means, and that's where you could miss it, where the person might ha absolutely know what, what it means. You know, there's a story about, I guess it was a guy at Bethel or somebody associated with Bethel, and they, this woman, he, this guy, he got this word, I think it was like yellow shirt. And he's like, this is ridiculous. You've heard that? And it was like, and I'm probably mangling some of the details, but it was like, he's like, I don't want to say that, you know? And finally he gave in, he relented, and he said something, you know, yellow shirt, and this woman on the other side of the room began to bawl and cry. And it was like her son had like autism or something. Yellow shirt. And so if he had tried to reason that out or the Lord says yellow shirt and I think the sun's going to shine brightly on you all today, like that would have that would have dampened the word for that woman because she would have questioned, was that for me or was that random? And so you have to just say what the Lord says and don't say anything more. Don't try to interpret unless the Lord gives you the interpretation. I have so many examples on all these, but I lack the time to go through them. Uh, you'll discover, and if you're on a prophetic ministry team, oftentimes one word will build on another. Like if we're, sometimes with, when Apostle Ryan and I are together or we're two or three people, like he'll get part of a word and then I'll get the other part um, or vice versa. We were in Moline and I had this word about how the Lord was going to mantle elderly people and I was trying to get the mic from his hands, Pastor Jason. And he had that look in his eye and I said, oh, no, 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 give me that mic. Oh, no, 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 no. And all before I could get it from his hand, he took that and he said, the Lord shows me there's a mantle coming on. And I said, no, you didn't. He's always stealing my words. And then after he says this, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, well, yeah, what he said. <laughs> but, but the, you know, I, I, I'm joking, and it, didn't, it doesn't irritate me. I thought, fine, because we're hearing that we're in the same, we're in that same little vein. I'm like, I'm starting next time. I ain't never get to say nothing. Yeah. Turn his mic off. But it happens a lot. It is good. It happens a lot. So, or he'll say part of it, and I'll say, that's right, the Lord said the same to me, but here's what he also said. And so it's a, t it's a continuation, a tag team. Or sometimes I just make stuff up because I don't have nothing to say. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> now, don't edit that part out and put it on YouTube. That ain't right. <laughs> that ain't right. That's not a tweetable. All right. Don't add to or take away from the prophecy. You're not the author or editor of it. Don't take holy handshakes. Don't charge people for prophecy. Reject. Uh, allow. Uh, avoid allowing your own emotions or ego or subjective experiences to supersede the word of God in your prophetic ministry. See, we don't want to prophesy through our emotions, through our party lines, through our denominational lines, through our opinions. We want to prophesy purely. Reject the fear of man. Oh, look at the devil. We were just talking about you, how you always steal my prophetic words. Like that time in Moline when I had this word about the elderly getting a mantle of glory, and all of a sudden I look over and you're like, and the Lord would say, and I'm like, no, you didn't. I was explaining how many times if you're ministering together, you can have, you can like tap into the same vein in the spirit and you're hearing the exact same thing, or you might get one part and I might pick up and prophesy the rest of it. And, it, and it's just, that's, that's what happens in tag team ministry. Reject the fear of man. We talked about that. Uh, da, 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 da. Don't name publicly ministers whose names you hear as part of controversial prophecies, especially if the word suggests they're in some sort of error, sin, or relational strife. And I want to open it up for questions here, but commit your heart to yielding to the Spirit and allowing Father to shape you into the image of Christ. If you do that, if you'll press into God, if you'll pray in the Holy Ghost, if you'll be a student of the word, you'll maintain or you'll cultivate and maintain an accurate prophetic spirit. So I'm, I'm stopping now with 
21 minutes left on purpose because you guys had so many questions last time and I just did two back to back. So, yes. Do we have a mi uh, my, uh, mic? Sometimes I, I, I listen to your um, um, Good Morning Holy Spirit and, and um, there's some things that are, are exactly happen at that same moment where you say this is happening in your life and I'm like, yeah. but, but it's not just one time, various times. So how, how do you uh, go like that to be so accurate and the things that are in the spirit? I know we are connected. But it's so in on point, so like right there, and it's right there that whatever you're saying is I'm feeling what I'm going through. How do you pick that on that? How do you, what do you suggest? I make Pastor Sierra pray for five hours and tell me what to say <laughs> every morning. You know, I think it comes from, you know, I start those prayer calls exalting Jesus. I start those prayer calls lifting up his name, and I just begin to pray and then it just comes out of me. I think it comes from intimacy with God. I think it comes with, you know, it, part of it is a gifting that I carry, but, you know, anybody can, can pray that way. Anybody can cultivate a prophetic spirit. I've got a whole teaching on cultivating a prophetic spirit. It's basically seeking intimacy, being a student of the word, praying in the spirit. I pray in the spirit a lot. Before I am on those calls, most days I'm up at 4 a.m. Prayer call starts at 6. So I'm reading the word, I'm praying. Um, you know, and some days, honestly, I start off praying on those calls and I'm like, man, I'm not getting nothing. And, and it'd be like, <laughs> you know, it'd be like the last five minutes. I'm like, this is what this call was about. <laughs> that we're leading up to this. So, you know, you just, it, you just got to spend more time with the Lord. It's, you can never spend too much time with the Lord. You can never go wrong spending time with the Lord. But it's really an intimacy and just, I don't know. It's almost like you, you, like some mornings I just, I don't know where I stopped and he started but I know it's not me anymore. And I just try not to get distracted when I'm in that flow. Amen. Anybody else? I, I have a question. Yes. Earlier you were talking about generational curses, works of the flesh, deception, and unholy vows, and you kept talking about all that. Is there a hit all prayer to take all that stuff down? Uh, I mean, there are really long prayers that supposed to cover everything. Um, I like to be led by the Spirit in all things, so I don't like blanket kind of prayers. I mean, the masonry, the Freemasonry thing is good. If you've been involved in that, it pretty much covers. But I like to be led by the Spirit. And usually in deliverance, someone mentioned processes and like an onion peel. Usually deliverance, the Lord could deliver somebody from everything all at once, but usually he does it little by little. Like the Israelites, they defeated their enemies little by little when they went into the promised land. And usually that's how it is as we grow in the Lord. It's little by little. Because the Lord knows if he, some people, if he delivered us from everything that we were carrying in that moment, we would be so stripped bare. He does it little by little so that we can get more and more of him to continue to get strong in that. Yes. So um, if you've been totally suckered and you actually received a false prophecy, what is the method of breaking that off of you? That's really good. I got a false prophecy from some person here one time. Wasn't part of this church, but she was visiting. And she said that God no longer wants me to dye my hair. I always get prophecies about my hair. I don't understand why. But what you generally do if you receive a prophecy, you know it's not the Lord. What I do is I break that word in Jesus' name. I don't receive it. I break the power of those words of death in my life in the name of Jesus. I send that back, and I bless that person that released it, but I curse that word. I won't receive it in Jesus' name. You just break it, and, you, and it's just easy. That's all it takes. I don't agree with it. I don't align with it. I, I, I break it in Jesus' name. Anybody else? You kind of mentioned um, or touched on like new doctrines and there's a lot of um, new teaching going on, but you know, it is tied into scripture on the sons of God and um, you know, a lot of courtroom in heaven intercession and stuff like that. What are your thoughts on, on that? Like were there, were there going to a place 
they still know they still see the need for the fivefold, but they think that this is the new thing and that's where it's going. Does there's, that make sense? There's always new things, there's always trends, there's always fads in the body of Christ, there's always teaching trends. Course of Heaven is one of them. I think there you know, I don't I have not actually read the book. I think there's a lot of good things in the Course of Heaven teachings. With what's happening with anything anything good the enemy tries to, to bring it to an excess or an extreme the enemy will always do that and so we have to stay rooted and grounded in the scripture and not like add to or take away and i think some of these times when you're seeing these trends or these fads in scripture and teaching you're it, it's it's like they're they're almost adding their opinion to it they're, they're interpreting it in a way that may or may not be right and I'm not speaking to the courts of heaven teaching because I don't know, I've not read that book. But many times people are inserting their opinion or their experiences. And experiences are great if they support the word of God, support the principle of the word of God. But the, but the, the experiences are detrimental if they're, if they're extra biblical and there's no scripture to support it. But then you're trying to build a whole thing around your experience instead of around the word. And I think that's where we're getting off in some of the body of Christ is people are building doctrines around an experience with maybe a little thimble full of scriptural support, but a lot of scriptural evidence that would say that's equally wrong. You know what I'm saying? Like there's gray areas and conflicting. People will, will, will say, here's one scripture, but the Bible says that if, by two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So if I'm building a teaching on something, I'm not selecting one scripture. I want to find, especially if it's something heavy, I want to find two or three or four. I want to build a whole case on it and not something where it's on the fringes where, you know, this is my opinion, this is my interpretation, this is my view. Uh, but, you know, you want to study even commentaries and scholars and understand the Greek and the Hebrew. It, it's not a matter, and there's just a lot of twisting, and I think it's some sincere twisting. I think people, you know, do have opinions and experiences, but, you know, the Bible says that Satan himself comes as an angel of light. And so just because you have an encounter doesn't mean it was from God. Just because you have an experience that was spiritual doesn't mean it was a Holy Spirit experience. And I think that's where a lot of that's going on. Yeah. Anybody else? I have a question just about like um, prophetic dreams. Uh, it seems like sometimes, I'm just now growing in this, but sometimes it seems like it's like a broad message sort of thing it's not a personal thing and it doesn't really seem to go to one person specifically but you know what is God doing through that is it just for my own understanding is it to, you know I, I just don't really understand why I'm getting like these broader like kingdom messages like this is what is happening sort of thing are you in these dreams uh no usually I'm not so if you're not in the dream it's usually prophetic in nature is it like end time stuff Those sound like intercessory prayer dreams. It sounds like the Lord is showing you things he wants to do or intends to do. Are you an intercessor? Well, I, it sounds to me like intercessory prayer dreams. Like he's showing you so you can get an agreement with him what he wants to do. And, and it's really a privilege and an honor that he's showing you those things because it means he's counting you faithful to pray. And he's counting you faithful to take it seriously. And he knows that you, know, and you were hungry enough to even ask that question. And he knew that you would before you asked it. So... That's, you should be honored. The Lord trusts you to show you things to come and to give you that opportunity to pray because you'll have part of the reward when those things come to pass because of your intercession. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Anybody else? Come on, somebody give me a hard question. Don't ask me when Jesus is coming back. I don't know. Do not know. Yes. So let's say you encounter someone that obviously has something on them or in them. Where do you start in trying to help them? Well, it depends on if you're in relationship with them. Because if you're not in relationship with them, then you have no business to confront them, whatever it is they're carrying that you think they're carrying. Um, so in that sense, if you feel a burden for that person, then you will pray for them. You know, if they're somebody in your church body, uh, you would first bathe that in prayer. But if you saw this person was really in bondage or in danger in some way or really going off in a bad path, you might then consider talking to your pastor or an elder, but in the right spirit, not in an accusatory, gossiping kind of spirit. If you're in relationship with them, again, begin always with prayer. 
But if you're in a relationship with them, then you can speak the truth in love. But the Bible says in Galatians 6 that we're to restore someone who's fallen into error with a spirit of gentleness. And so the spirit with which you approach somebody, you know, it, it's never good. There's this uh, teaching, um, Keep Your Love On, um, by that Beth Danny Silk. And, you know, if you go to people say, well, you know, all six of us see this about you, then that's not the way to approach somebody because, you're like, you know, all six of us see this, so it must be true. You know, you, you should say, that, you know, what I usually do is say, I've seen some things and they seem out of character for you. It seems like perhaps maybe you're going through something, but I've seen some things a little out of character for you, and I just wanted to, to know, are you okay? And they said, what do you see? So then they're asking you, then they want to know because you've come to them with a gentle spirit. Hmm? Yes. Um, earlier we talked about um, visitations from dead saints. Yes, I um, remember and that. Dead relatives. Did you have one? I have, uh, no, no. <laughs> Thank God. I would have dealt with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, how do you address a person um, who is constantly having these? And um, I know people who are not in leadership positions, and then I personally know people who are in leadership positions, and, they, and they've had um, – Old, dead prophets in American history come and visit them, and they say and and drop mantles on them. How do you address them, especially when they, they when they're um, they really really want your approval on it and stuff like that? And you know you don't want to crush them, but you have to say you know no, this is of the devil. So, so how do you deal with that? As you're asking, how do you deal with that? Well, if it's a leader, if it's leader to leader, that's one thing. It'd be a private matter. Uh, but if it's your leader, you can't really say anything. Okay, good. Um, you know, you, I would go to them and ask them what they're basing that on Scripture, you know, and let them study it out for themselves and find out what their reasoning is. And then it's almost like you're an apologetic at that point. You're, 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 you know, Dr. Michael Brown would rip that up in a minute. As a matter of fact, I'm going to ask him about that next time I talk to him, where he stands on that, what his, what his reasoning is uh, to get a better understanding. But you almost like make them justify in Scripture. And if they can't, just based on experience, tell them that, you know, the Bible says that even Satan comes as an angel of light. And not every, you know, not every supernatural experience is a Holy Spirit experience. And then challenge them to show you in Scripture. They'll bring back the cloud of witnesses. They'll bring back, uh, you know, the uh, Mount, Tr Mount of Transfiguration. They'll bring back, you know, those who live and never die. There's different Scriptures that people are basing this on. But, you know, challenge them. And then you study. Because if you feel led to address this, you're going to have to be armed with Scripture. Uh, but that's the best way is to just go back to the Word. Because otherwise it's your Word against theirs and, you know. That's not going to convince them because the Holy Spirit's the convincer. What would open the gate for the dead? Wow. Um, false teaching. You send it to somebody that's teaching that and you believe it would be one. Um, you know, seeking supernatural encounters. We should seek God, the God of the supernatural. And if he wants to give us an encounter, he will. But once we start seeking the supernatural, we become obsessed with that. We open ourselves up to visitations that are not of God. Um, those are the two biggest ones. There's probably others. I mean, I think watching paranormal, supernatural, super, you know, all those ghost things, that, that could potentially, I think, open you up to something like that. Um, you know, any kind of occult thing could open you to something like that because I think that is, I think that is occultish. So those are three things I think that could possibly, there may be more. Anybody else? Oh, don't come to me after. Oh boy. Right. Sure. How do you deal with watchmen who don't want accountability because of hurts and wounds? I would say the first thing I would try to do is establish a relationship of trust with them to let them know that you, you, you know, if they have a true gift, that you validate that gift, that you honor that gift, that you want to see that gift express and that you want to see that joint supply uh, and, you know, suggest that, you know, just build that relationship of trust to where you can then be, have earned the right to say, Listen, I value and trust your gift. You, you know, the Bible speaks of submitting ourselves one to another. Uh, there's, there's scripture of that nature uh, and others. Uh, and really, I think for, the, for your gift to be of its fullest expression and to be 
uh, for your credibility to be even stronger, you know, because you don't want to suggest they don't have any credibility, but, you know, for you to go up higher, you know, the Lord wants to yoke you up and align you with people that can help lift you up and, and get your message out and, and pose it in a way, because that's the truth. Because the Lone Ranger prophets are, you know, not always accepted, you know, and you can even explain that. Those who walk alone sometimes are not accepted, that people in this hour are looking for uh, people that have strong relationships and accountability because there's so much deception. And I would tell them, although you, you're very accurate and I trust your voice, other people may not. And so you, you have to also make sure that they don't think you're just trying to be their apostle, but that you're just, you know, and that you probably should be. I mean, if you're, you're that concerned, they should probably align with you. But it's not about you. It's about, it's about them. And I think if you share it from that perspective, you know, but it comes, it comes back to trust because their trust has been violated, and that's why they don't want to submit. Yeah. Prophetess LeClaire. Oh, boy. Can you <laughs> give me a hard one? No, 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 no. I, actually, I just want to kind of get your um, advice and then your perspective on something. So he was asking about the people that begin to have these teachings about these dead people and all this good stuff. For you personally, would you have a caution in your spirit to do ministry with them? Do you feel like if you did a, a conference or something with, with them, do you feel like you would be supporting what they believe? Because I know um, just from watching you and a couple of conversations, I know a, there's a grace in your life to help purify the prophetic and true. Yeah. And then the last part of that question would be um, what are some methods or – uh, tools you discover that help with backlash. Oh, wow. Certain places and certain things. That's a book. Okay. <laughs> it's my next book. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that if there are certain people that are way off in sin that I know that I wouldn't even want to share a platform with them, there are others that perhaps have different opinions of things than I do. Even the dead thing, there are people that I respect that actually believe that and I don't think I would invite them to my conference but I don't know that I would not go to another conference where they were there at the same conference um, but there's some that I would not even go near the conference if they were there because I don't even want my name on the same poster as theirs but the dead people thing there there are people who I have ministered with who do believe that and I'm hoping to establish enough trust with them where I can challenge that and you can't do that without relationships so it's a fine line I mean, if the, some of these guys and girls are preaching this stuff more low-key and they're not being very open about it, some of them are very, very bold. And so I think it depends on all, who else they're also aligned with because you don't know maybe whoever they're aligned with is dealing with it behind the scenes. And we don't want to just shun everybody because they're an error. But there are some errors that are serious, and that's one of them. I would be very reticent to share a platform with someone that, that was full-on preaching that hardcore. Um, but, uh, but if the Lord told me to do it, See, there's sometimes the Lord will tell you to go do stuff like that. Go minister with that person. Make a connection with them. I'm going to use you to help speak into that. And the other part with the backlash, wow. You know, I think we have to know our enemy. We have to be on the offense and not the defense. We can't wait. It's like, Let's take witchcraft, for example. You know, you can't wait until witchcraft settles in on you to try to break it off. You know, you, you begin to sense when you're under attack. You know, Apostle Ryan has the book, Eight Symptoms of a Spiritual Attack. It's not called that, but that's what he discusses in it. It's called, um, what's your book called? It's called uh, Overcoming Spiritual Attack. And it talks about there's, there's you know, you, you kind of sense when you're starting to get under attack. But sometimes, you know, we're too busy. We're working. We're in the middle of something. We don't want to stop and pray. So the Bible says to, to, to deal with the devil at his onset. You don't wait until... He's entrenched. You know, when he starts poking at you with his toe, you don't even let him get a toehold so that he can get a foothold, so he can get a stronghold. So a lot of it's being uh, vigilant and being uh, sober-minded, stable, knowing the enemy's out there, but not being paranoid. You get the other side of it's being paranoid. But, you know, when the backlash does come, you know, the Bible, you know, when they were persecuted in the book of Acts, in the book of Acts it says, and they ran to their own company. And that's one of the biggest things when, you, when you're under attack, Maybe you didn't sense it. Now you've been blindsided. Sometimes you just get blindsided. Like, you don't even see it coming. Just this happens. You get blindsided. That's when you run to your own company. You run to the people who know how to pray, who know how to cover, who you can trust, not going to try to humiliate you because you just got blindsided and you're, you know, having a hard time. So I think those are the two things. You stay prayed up, lifestyle, intimacy with God. The Lord will warn you of many things if you spend time with him. 
but there are blind sides. So the backlash and intercessors, man, you need to start gathering intercessors around you. You probably have some already, but you probably you probably need more, especially running with this guy, you know, because that's a serious thing, you know. So I've got uh, more and more intercessors. I had a group from my house of prayer the other night um, because of some things that have been coming against me, uh, coming against my physical body. Um, they stayed up all night and prayed to try to break. Because part sometimes when you're sick, part of it is, it's just like you're just tired and you're sick, but part of it's also the warfare. And with me, I've always it's never just one thing. There's always a warfare element to it. It's most likely that way for you too. So ramp up those intercessors, brother. You know? Can I ask one more question? Sorry. Yeah. One more. This is another interesting question. So um, I was telling the apostle them the other day, it's my personal opinion, but I kind of see you like as the Joyce Myers of the prophetic. <laughs> <laughs> so how does it, what kind of barriers you went through as a woman coming up as a prophetess um, and just the kind of like challenges that you might have to deal with just dealing with gender, just the, sh the, the, the grace you carry, um, the way that you speak, and it's kind of like a no partiality male or female. And I know that you probably ran against a lot of prejudice kind of things. Yeah. Well, I... You know, I think that the biggest thing is that I've been delivered of you. So I don't care what you think. Not just you, Brent. I mean, I care what my friends think, but, like, I don't care what you think. I don't care if you don't like me. I don't. I don't care if you agree with me. I don't care. I, I'm not trying to offend you, but if, if the word of God coming out of my mouth offends you, I don't care. And so I've, I don't have the fear of man. If I had the fear of man, I would have been paralyzed and crippled a long time. I just don't, I don't, I want you to like me. I mean, I want people, I want to have, you know, but I don't care if you don't. So that's the one thing. The other thing that I always say is, I think the very best thing I have going for me in all of my life is that I just refuse to give up. If you're easily intimidated, if you're easily stopped, if the warfare can stop you, then it'll stop you. But I have just always had a persevering spirit, and I don't take credit for that. The Lord must have done something in me because when I was younger, I was lazy. You know, I didn't do want to do anything. I just did as little as possible. But something changed in me at some point, and I just, I'm just determined. I've just got a determination, and, and I think those two things, being determined to do the will of God and not having any fear of man, and those two things right there will take you really, really really far like I don't care I've run into some religious men and I you know I just kind of laugh at him because that's what God's doing you know he's just like oh you poor silly thing I mean he's not mad at him but he's just like you know whatever amen I think we're out of time so I hope that this bless you let me pray for you father I thank you in the name of Jesus for these students God I ask you, Lord, to develop in them a, an even more prophetic, more accurate spirit in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that you give them even the discerning of spirits that they will recognize, know, and understand the presence of enemy, the presence of demons and how to deal with it in a right manner, in a responsible manner. And I thank you that you even give them a revelation of their authority in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Thanks, you guys. You're great students.